Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued goodness and tender mercies towards us. As we begin to investigate the work of the enemy and its relationship to the 2520, we ask for your continued blessing and your tender mercies towards us so that our minds may be open and free to understand the communications that you are trying to have with your people in these last days. Bless us now, we ask and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as a way of a quick summary, we see that the model that's been built in Revelation chapter 11 has two groups of people that are separated by a wall. We spent quite a lot of time looking at these people who are in the temple and there's another group which are in the outer court and we've shown that this wall is a Sabbath and we've discussed at length who this group is. It's the Seventh-day Adventist Church and just as way of, of a quick summary, I just want to read three short passages to you, passages that we've already read. The first one is found in Great Controversy 508. It says, Satan is continually seeking to overcome the people of God by breaking down the barriers which separate them from the world. Ancient Israel were enticed into sin when they ventured into forbidden association with the heathen. In a similar manner, our modern Israel led astray. Here she talks about the Seventh-day Adventist Church being modern Israel. CET 9.3 The first day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, but I saw that it read the same as when written on the tables of stone by the finger of God and delivered to Moses on Sinai. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating rule, the wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers, and that the Sabbath is the great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. Here she calls us true Israel. And then the last one, Seven Testimonies 108, she says, we are strictly denominational. We are sacredly denominated by God and are under his theocracy. And then she says, we are God's denominated people. And we saw that they related to these terms. There were about, there were in fact seven altogether terms that we looked at. But I want us to be clear how God views this group here who are worshipping in the temple. He considers them to be modern Israel, true Israel, his denominated people. And this is in stark contrast to this group who are in the outer court. Now there are many truths, there are many depths to the scriptures. And even in these verses, there are, there are deeper depths than, than we're exploring. But we're just picking up one thread um, from these verses. And it's this truth here about... In the dispensation, after 1844, God would create a people. He would create the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We discussed how we were given, how we were named, how ancient Israel were named, how there, there have only been two named groups since th the creation. And these different terms, how they relate to us and how God views his people today. And this is, there are differences between these terms, these concepts and ideas, than how Paul viewed the Christian church in the dispensation which I have termed New Testament church. There are other terms we could give it, but between AD 34 and 1844, that time period there, um, which Ellen White calls the 1810 years which were given over to the Gentiles in great controversy, um, that was a different dispensation. And when Paul talks in the epistles about spiritual Israel, the dynamics are different to the dynamics of this situation. Now, this model, this idea, is critical for us to understand when 
we come to look at the 2520 because it explains an awful lot of, of what the 2520 is about, um, what God's purpose was and how his will is always fulfilled, even though his people um, fail him and break the covenant that he has given to them. We've spoken about this concept, this idea of the covenant a number of times. I just want to briefly, um, in concept, discuss this idea. Now, when we go to Leviticus chapter 26, where we started our studies from, um, we spoke in verses 1 and 2 how God gave instructions to his people that they should reverence his law, keep the Sabbath holy, and if they would, he would bless them, and if they wouldn't, he would curse them. Um, and we've read many times in our previous study, um, and the study before that, about this concept of being under a covenant relationship with him. I just want to give a simple overview of this idea of the covenant. It's a, an area that sometimes we, as God's people, get confused with. So, the covenant equals. I like using equals or equivalents because it really makes things simplified and it makes things clear in our minds. The covenant is the Ten Commandments. If we can grapple with that and understand it and be comfortable with that, it explains all the complexities, all the apparent anomalies that we find in the scripture um, when we come to look at the covenant, the new covenant, the old covenant, uh, when, we, when we get this, all these different ideas, if we can understand that the covenant really is the Ten Commandments, um, it really clarifies things and makes things very simple. We've read that the Sabbath is a sign. It's an idea that um, we as Adventists are fairly comfortable with and familiar with, and we read it's a sign of the covenant. And there are various reasons and thoughts why God says that. The Sabbath in many ways is unique when you compare it to the other nine commandments. Um, but this is a sign that you're keeping the commandments of God, that you have under a covenant relationship with him. We know circumcision was also a sign as well. Um, so we know at Mount Sinai, God went into a covenant relationship with ancient Israel. And the covenant was, sometimes we term this the old covenant, the covenant that he made with his people Israel, is that if you keep my commandments, you will be my people and I will be your God. Now, the terms or the the details of how that covenant works, that agreement works, vary. When Israel first went into that, that agreement, that covenant with, with God, we know that they failed. They said, everything that you tell us to do, we will do. And promptly, they turned their backs on God, made a golden calf, and broke the covenant. We know they broke the covenant, and we know, we know clearly um, from, that, from that story uh, what the covenant was, because when Moses comes down from the mountain with the tables of stone, to show them that they've broken the covenant, he breaks those tables of stone. He breaks them as a sign that the covenant which those stones represent, the Ten Commandments, has now been broken. And because of the repentance that follows through with that, we know that the covenant gets re-established with his people because there's a second set of Ten Commandments that are made. Now, I don't want to discuss this idea of new and old covenant, but essentially the difference is that the old covenant um, is essentially keeping the law, keeping these Ten Commandments in your own strength, and the new covenant is keeping the covenant, these Ten Commandments, in your heart. We know that the New Covenant, God describes it in various places, the Old and New Testament. He says, I will write my laws upon your hearts. But the covenant itself is the same. The covenant is the Ten Commandments. 
whether it's old or new. The old or new only has reference to the motivations and the abilities and the, um, the terms of the agreement of how that covenant is going to be kept, whether it's going to be in the flesh or whether it's going to be the, through the power of God. The complexity comes with the covenant um, when we start building other components into it because we know associated with this covenant relationship with an that ancient Israel had that there was this whole ceremonial system and sometimes we get confused by that and we think that the ceremonial system in some way was um, an additional part or um, a component of this covenant but it really wasn't it was um, just a way of living and operating under the terms and conditions that God had established with his people, ancient Israel. So one of the things that happen at Mount Sinai is that the Sabbath is essentially reinstituted, they know about it before, and the, and the Ten Commandments are given. So when we come to the dispensation in post-1844, one of the things that comes up again is this idea of going into a covenant relationship with his people. We read that a number of times, as I've said. Ellen White uses these terms here, and inbuilt into all this reasoning is the issue of the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is a vital component in this re-establishment of the covenant that God has with his people, with modern Israel, with his denominated people. And it's the Sabbath truth that had been missing for centuries before, which is brought out again and once that truth is being brought out again and God's people accept it um, now we know that the covenant relationship with between God and his people is being re-established the history of Sinai the giving of the law and the history of God's people the Seventh-day Adventist Church post 1844 are identical um, when you see a one-to-one -one mapping out of that you can see stark similarities and just on a simple level the, the one thing that we know for sure is that the Ten Commandments in their entire, entirety are re-established in, in the post-1844 experience when the church um, is re-established and formed and a term that is used frequently in the um, New Testament is that this concept of God's people being a temple so we know that a temple represents his people and even Revelation 11 verse 1 talks about that, the measure of this temple. It's talking about his people on one level. So we know once this temple is fully formed, is re-established, some of the Adventist church has come back on the scene, we should expect them to keep, to re-establish this covenant relationship that God has got with them and the major component that's been missing from this covenant relationship has been the Sabbath. And that's why Ellen White talks over and over again about the Sabbath being this wall of separation, the thing that marks us different from everyone else. So we're, we're going to put this, this part of the study to one side at the moment. We'll pick it up again um, as we come towards the end of our study on the 2520. But I want you to understand the reason why we've gone through why we've laboured this point about God's denominated people, this separation, is to show how this idea that Israel has come back on the scene, that the covenant relationship between God and his people has now been re-established post-1844. And when that happens, then there is a distinction between his people and everyone else. There's a break between them. And you don't see that modelling before 1844. If you turn to your Bibles, to Revelation 12, a passage that all Adventists are familiar with, Revelation 12, 17. This concept, this idea, is encoded in this very verse. Verse 17 reads, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Here we read about three groups of people. 
We read about the woman. We read about her seed. And we read about the remnant. Of the seed. And we as a people are familiar that there is no distinction between these three groups. They're just a single continuum of what was started at the beginning. So whoever the woman was, her seed are of the same substance and so are the remnant of the seed. And we as a people recognise ourselves to be the remnant of the seed. So even very simplistically in chapter 12, we can see that this idea of this continuation of God's people being on earth, the re-establishment of them, is familiar territory to us. You will have noticed that I've laboured the point, two points specifically. First of all, the historical time setting of this verse, so that we understand clearly that this is dealing with a history that begins in 1844. And the second point is when this history begins, there are two groups of people and Israel has come back on the scene now and they now are keeping the Ten Commandments, they've gone back into covenant relationship with God and now there are two groups of people. If there are any questions running through your minds, please bear in mind that there are other truths contained in these uh, verses which I'm not dealing with um, but they don't, uh, those different ideas and models don't um, challenge or undo any of the information that I'm giving you. There are different thoughts, different levels, which I'm not addressing. So now we're going to pick up from the, the last portion of verse 2 in chapter 11. So let's read verse 2. The word says, But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So we want to look at this this idea of these Gentiles and these 42 months. Now we've already taken just a cursory look at this concept of these Gentiles. We've said they're distinct from God's people and we've given them these general terms as, using Ellen White's language, heathenism, um, the world, um, those who are unconverted, the people who are separate, all the, all the rest of the world, the other denominations, who are separate from us. But in the context of this discussion, with, when it's specifically talking about the 40 and 2 months, this idea of who the Gentiles are isn't a general term. It's a very, it deals with a very specific group of people, a very specific power, if I can put it that way. And we just want to take some time to look at that and, and to just tie some pieces together. If you recall, when we were in the Gospels, the information that brought us here in the first place, I'll just read to you not the portions from the Scriptures, but that um, the, the, the passage that I had um, formulated, putting all the, all the information from the three Gospels together and how I had um, put them in my own words. So I'm just going to read that again to you. And then Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. During this time, the time of the Gentiles, there shall be great tribulation greater than anything since the world began, even to the end of the world. And we saw clearly how we can link this passage here found in <clears throat> Matthew, Mark and Luke and we could link it to Revelation 11. And we use these terms here, this treading down the Gentiles. So we want to address who are these Gentiles here? What is this um, term when it talks about the times of the Gentiles? I will remind you, when it says times of the Gentiles, the times are in plural, and we want to keep that in the back of our minds. It's an important idea that we will come to. So this 42 months, I'm not going to go ahead and prove this. Most Adventists who are listening to this presentation are familiar with this information, that the 42 months, first of all, one month equals 30 days. We can find that from Genesis. It's a straightforward calculation, straight 
forward the observation to make. Also, we know that there are 12 months in one year. There are various portions in the Old Testament that we can go through, certain historical facts, uh, the book of Esther, um, the history when David become king. There are various passages that we can go to to show that there are 12 months in a year. And it's not a difficult calculation to show that if there's 30 days is one month, maybe if I write this the other way around, 30 days equals one month, and 12 months equals one year. So if we want to find out how many days there are in a year, we do a simple calculation of 30 times 12, and we get the answer 360 days. 3 twelves are 36, 12, 24, 36. So we know that there are 360 days in a year, very simple. So if we do 42 months times 360, sorry, times 30, we get 1,260 days. Now, this time prophecy, this 1260 days, is perhaps the most important time prophecy there is in the Bible. The reason why I suggest that is that it's the only prophecy that comes up seven times. This prophecy appears seven times in the Bible. So we know that God doesn't repeat things for the sake of it. So he really must try to be telling us something about the importance and the relevance of this time prophecy. I'll give you the seven, seven passages of scripture that it's found in. It's found in the book of Daniel and Revelation. It's found in Daniel 7, 25. Daniel 12, 7. Revelation 11.2, which, which is where we're talking about. 11 verse 3, Revelation 12 6, 12.14, and 13.5. It's a very interesting study to go through these seven verses line them up and to begin to pick out similarities between these different passages. By doing that, what we find is that all these seven occurrences of this 1,260 years, using a day for a year, and these passages use different terminology. Sometimes they use this term Time times dividing of time. Sometimes they use this term 42 months. Sometimes they use this term 1,203 score days. And when you collect all this information together and you begin to see similarities in this, what you clearly see, it's very simple to do, is that the power that it's, deep, that it's talking about in all these seven passages is the same power. It's talking about the same entity, the same power that is being dealt with in these seven passages here. So whoever these Gentiles are that tread down Jerusalem, the holy city, for 42 months, for 1,260 years, is the same power that is dealt with in all these passages. We're not going to spend time to go through all them, but I will show you the connection between 11.2 and one of the other passages. In fact, I'll actually go through three, three, three of those passages. So we're going to tackle 
Daniel 7.25, Daniel 12.7, Revelation 11.2, obviously, and the passage that we've already dealt with, which is Luke 21.24, which is where we started this, this thread of investigation from. So if you turn to your Bibles and... Let's read Daniel 7, 25. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. The word reads, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. Now, I'm not going to go here, I'm not going to prove that that times, times and half a time is the 1260 years. It's very, you can, it's very easy to, to show that. But the thing that I want to pick out from here, it says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So whoever this power is, and in, when you go to Daniel chapter 7, it's talking about this, this little horn. It says it shall wear out the saints. So that's the, that, that's the phrase that we're picking out from Daniel chapter 7. If we turn to Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, it reads, And I heard a man clothed in linen which was upon the waters of the river. When he, heard, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth for ever, that it should be for a time, times, and a an half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So here it talks about scattering the power of the holy people. It's talking about the same thing. When we're dealing here, we're dealing with the little horn. When we're dealing in Daniel chapter seven, uh, 12, verse 7, we're dealing with the king of the north. Now, Daniel chapter 12 and Daniel chapter 7 are, a continu are, are one prophecy, they're a continuation. And if you thread your way through that, uh, Daniel chapter 11 and go into Daniel chapter 12, you'll see that this he that it's dealing with when it says, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, it's talking about the king of the north. So let's go to um, Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. And we've read here, it says, the holy city shall they tread underfoot. So here is this treading. And this is dealing with the Gentiles. And... If we read, and we've already done this time and again, Luke 21, verse 24, and it says, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so here, again, it uses this word. It says, treading down and it's these Gentiles that are doing this. So we know that this treading down and the, this treading underfoot and this treading down is the same language, and that's what, that, that's what gave us the ability to connect Luke and Revelation together. But this wearing out of the saints, this scattering uh, the power of the holy people, this training underfoot, is all dealing with the same thing. So these entities here, this little horn, the king of the north, and the Gentiles, are all the same power. <coughs> we can go through all of these passages, and we can pick up threads, we can pick up you know, connections between different passages pick up different points. And by doing that, cross-referencing all these seven together, um, we can clearly see that it's dealing with the same power. It's not an assumption that we're making. The word clearly shows us that. As we have we done here, we've picked out these same 
uh, actions, these same activities of these powers, which are described with, with different imagery, but they're all, dealing with the same, they're all doing the same activity, they're the same power. We don't have any problem to understand that this little horn in Daniel chapter 7 is talking about the papacy. Some people listening to this presentation may not be aware because not many people have studied um, Daniel chapter 11 to the extent that they have Daniel chapter 7. It's not as familiar territory. But this king of the north at the end of the world is the papacy. So when we come to Luke, when we come to Revelation 11, this idea of the Gentiles is also dealing with the papacy. So, Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. Remember, when you're looking at scriptures, there, there are different points to be gained from the same verse. One point that we picked out was that there are two groups at the end of the world. There are those in the outer court, and there are God's people. And then we pick up this other concept of who these Gentiles are, specifically from a prophetic sense when we're dealing with these 42 months or 1260 days, it's dealing with the papacy and its activities. And the papacy for 1260 days, 1260 years, are going to tread down Jerusalem, God's holy people. So not only does verses 1, verses one and 2 of, of Revelation 11 give us this history post-1844, it also gives us um, a glimpse of the history pre-1844 as well. It gives a, this, this whole time continuum. Now, this is a study on the 2520, so we're not here trying to prove and to re-establish the 1260-year prophecy. So when I give you a timeline of this period, I'm not going to attempt to prove those dates with historical information or turning to other portions of scripture or going to spirit of prophecy to show you this. It's an established truth uh, in Adventism. So this 1260 years that it's talking about begins in 538 AD and ends in 1798. And it's a 1260 years. I will say that the event that marks the beginning of this 1260 is when the papacy arises to become the king of the world, when the third horn of Daniel chapter 7 is taken down, and that occurs in 538, and then the prophecy ends 1260 years later when the papacy re re uh, receives a deadly wound, when Napoleon, through his general Berthier, comes and deposes the, the Pope at Rome. So they're, 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 they're the historical events that, that mark the beginning and end of this time period. But I want us to understand this, that that's what it's talking about in verse 2. So there are two things that we've got from Revelation 11, verses 1 and 2. We've got this period here from 538 to 1798, and then we have this other time period here, 1844 onwards. And in the period 1844 onwards, we're talking about these two distinct groups, the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the Gentiles. And we're also talking about, in this time period here, the papacy are treading down God's people. And that's when, we, when I took you to Revela uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, how we can see this continuum of God's people running through history. Now, remember using the terminology that's given in Luke, we're talking about the times of the Gentiles. So we know that we've been given these 42 months are 1260 days. So we know that this time period here, we've only got one time period to deal with. 
And remember I said that it says times of the Gentiles, talking in its plural, so there must be two times of the Gentiles. One of these times of the Gentiles that's spoken about must be this one. So I'm going to put it in its singular. This is the time of the Gentiles. So this is the time of the Gentiles when the Gentiles are going to be ruling, are going to be uh, lording it over, are going to be persecuting, treading down God's people from 538 to 1798. So this is the time of the Gentiles that's spoken of by Luke, chapter 21, verse 24. It does say times. And remember when we looked at this study, we said we were going to go to two different places, the book of Daniel, book of Revelation, to show that. And we will show that there is another time of the Gentiles somewhere else. But this is the first time of the Gentile that we're dealing with. It's the 1260 years from 538 to 1798. And we get that from going from Luke to Revelation, confirming that Revelation 11.2 is talking about the papacy and how it persecutes God's people. We know that the 42 months represents 1260 days, years. So we can have this timeline here and we can be clear that the time of the Gentiles spoken in Luke is the 1260 years, at least one portion of it is. So this is the first portion of our, of our study. We've, we've, we've now looked through Revelation 11 and we've gleaned as, as much information as we need to for the moment from Revelation and what we've found is the first component of the time of the Gentiles that, Luke's direct, that Luke directs us to. And in connection with this concept, this time of the Gentiles, this 1260 years of treading down of persecution, we also have this idea, this model, this concept that at the end of the world there's going to be these two distinct groups of people and the thing that distinguishes them is that the Seventh-day Adventist church here are God's denominated people and they are under a covenant relationship with him. And this group here isn't. And this group here is being investigated, is being measured, is being judged. This group here is not. It should not have escaped your attention that this is the very dark ages that we spoke about in the Gospels. Remember when we had those three histories? This is the middle history here. So in the middle history, when we spoke in the Gospels, and I gave dates to, those, uh, to that time period, 538 to 1798, it's by coming to the book of Revelation that we can verify that those dates that I had originally given you in the Dark Ages is in fact correct. It's these 1260 years. So we're going to go back into the Gospels now, briefly, and pick up the second thread that Christ gives us when he directs us to go to the book of Daniel. He directed us to go to the book of Revelation, which we've done in accordance with his instructions, glean the information that we need to there to understand what these times of the Gentiles is. It's these 1260 years of papal persecution. In connection with that, it talks about the historical context of who the worshippers are in the temple, who the Gentiles are. And now we want to go back into the Gospels and then the Gospels will springboard us into the book of Daniel. So we're going to be looking at Luke, we'll begin with Matthew, Matthew 24, 15, Mark 13, 14, and Luke 21, 20. Again, I'm not going to read the individual Gospels. Please do that. And in connection with that, um, read Desire of Ages 630.3, chapter 69. It's the, it's the chapter that deals with this whole prophecy. And I'm going to 
summarise this in my own words. These three Gospels here. And this is how I read what these Gospels are saying. When you shall see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, which are the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, standing in the holy place where they ought not to be, then know that the desolation of Jerusalem is near at hand. Let him that reads this prophecy understand. So there are various things that we need to pick out from here. That there's an army that's, in, that's spoken about. This army in one gospel, and the armies are spoken about in Luke, are also called a different name in Matthew and Mark. And they're called the abomination of desolation. And God says, when you see this army, this abomination of desolation, standing in the holy place, then know, when you see this sign here, then you know that the desolation or the destruction of Jerusalem is just about to occur. So, you're living in Jerusalem and you see an army come and you see this army standing in the holy place where they're not supposed to be. When you see that event occur, you know that the destruction of Jerusalem hasn't happened but it's just about to occur. Very interesting prophecy. And then Christ says that all of this history, this event, all of this here is prophesied. It's already been prophesied that it's going to occur. And this prophecy is found in the book of Daniel. So if you want to understand about this prophecy, go into the book of Daniel to understand what's going on. And in fact, it's not just a recommendation that if you feel like doing that, go ahead and do it. God, really, he's instructing his disciples to go into the book of Daniel, read, study, and find out what's going to happen so that you can, have, you can make the necessary preparation for when that time occurs. Now, in the book Great Controversy, Ellen White discusses this history at some length. We know the destruction of Jerusalem occurs in AD 70. So... These events here occur in AD 70. We've already discussed this in previous studies. I just want to briefly just go over the sequence of events that occurred here. Very simply, over just the next, take a bit, minute or so to do that. Now, sometimes people get thrown out by this term here, holy place. And they expect... Evangelical Christians do this a lot. They expect this holy place to be referring to the temple, and it's not. It's not referring to the temple here. So if I draw a simple map of Jerusalem, so this is, a, this is just a, a map of Jerusalem. Surrounding Jerusalem, and I put it in dotted lines, because there is no real boundary. For several hundred yards, there is this concept that although Jerusalem is a walled city, and in one level, this is a holy place. Remember, if we go to Revelation 11 verse 2, it says, In the holy city shall they tread underfoot. And this concept of Jerusalem being holy, it shouldn't be a surprise to us. So when it talks about this holy place, it's talking about Jerusalem here being a holy place.
It's talking about Jerusalem being a holy place. But I want to bring in this concept that surrounding Jerusalem, there is land which is outside the city walls, which is also considered to be part of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem does not terminate when you get to the walls. Jerusalem, the city, extends some way past that. The reason we know that is that when we see ancient Israel come into the land of Canaan and the land is divided up between all the different tribes, the 11 tribes, we know that Levite does not have an inheritance, but the Levites are given cities and they're called cities of refuge. Now because the Levites don't have an inheritance, all they have is cities, they still need some land to work. So associated with these cities, they are given land which extends several hundred yards outside the city walls. And so this concept or this idea that a city extends beyond the walls itself is introduced. If you read carefully this whole, the, the whole dynamics about the, the concept of these cities of refuge, we know it's an historical fact that if, if you are being chased by, um, I'll, I'll give the scenario, you accidentally, accidentally get into a conflict with a brother, he is killed in this, in this fight. Whether or not it's an accident or not, it doesn't matter. Your first concern now is to leave where you are and run to a city of refuge because his relatives have a right to kill you and take punishment against you. So what you need to do is you need to flee to a city of refuge so that you can have judgment because this is where you would be judged. Now, it's, what happens is, is when you're running to this place, as soon as you get within the boundaries of the city, you are now considered free. So you don't have to actually get into the city. As soon as you pass this boundary, you know that you're in the city. And so that's where this whole idea comes from, that the, 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 the city itself, its boundaries, not the walls, but it's some area outside of that. And this area here is the area that's given to essentially the Levites who, who own these cities um, so that they have land to work because they have no inheritance. So when it talks about this army standing in the holy place, it's not referring to the fact that they actually stand within, the, within Jerusalem here, within the bounds of the wall, but it's talking about when they see an army standing on the outside of Jerusalem. When they're with, but they're still within the precincts of this area that's, that borders Jerusalem. This idea is important. If you're going to siege a city, once you break through the walls, you've already got hold of the city, you're, it's already in your possession. But if you're outside the boundaries of the walls, then you still haven't got possession of the city, it's just been under siege. So if this holy place were talking about the area that's within the city walls, or if it was talking about the temple itself, then you wouldn't be able to say that the destruction of Jerusalem is just about to occur, because it would have already occurred. So you can see within the language itself, this model is correct. And if you read Great Controversy, Ellen White talks about this. She talks about how uh, the armies of Rome plant their standard in this land, this area here, which is outside the city wall. So that's, that's what happened. Um, Rome comes up, plants its standards in the, most holy, in the holy place, sorry, uh, which is outside the, um, the walls of Jerusalem. And then they become distracted and then they retreat from this siege that, has, that they've initiated. Um, they, get, they have a call to go to another place. And in this time period, when they come down and stand, put their banners, they stand in the, most, in the holy place, then they leave. If you're a Christian and you've read this information here, you know that when you saw this thing happening, you saw them planting their standards, their flag here in the holy place, you know that this was a sign that Jerusalem, that the destruction of Jerusalem is about to occur. Now, if they had stayed and that you would say, oh, here's a sign, you would not have been able to flee. It's the ability, it's, it's the, the sequence or events or the events that ha occurred that Rome departed and they left the siege of Jerusalem 
that gave this breathing space for the Christians. So by faith, they understood what God had said and they had seen this event here and then they knew that the destruction of Jerusalem is just about to occur. In this breathing space, when Rome leaves, all the Christians flee Jerusalem. Sometime later, the Romans come back, seize Jerusalem again for the second time, and this time they stay, and the destruction of Jerusalem occurs in AD 70. So this is, that's a, a brief synopsis of this verse, the, the, these verses here that are given that talk about how Rome came, planted its standard in the holy place, withdraw, and in this withdrawal, the Christians have opportunity to leave, and as Ellen White says, not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. They come back and they destroy Jerusalem and the temple, and Jesus' prophecy that one stone would not be left upon another was fulfilled. Now this prophecy here is found in the book of Daniel. So we are required to go into the book of Daniel and to see where this prophecy is found and what information Daniel gives us. In summary, we have gone to the book of Revelation. We have found the first thread of these times of the Gentiles this 1260 years. We're now going to go into the book of Daniel and find another thread, some more information about these times of the Gentiles. We'll then, given, using the license that Christ has given us, join these thoughts, these concepts together and begin to build up a, a, a better picture of what the 2520 is all about, what it means and how it impacts us today and how it impacted ancient Israel and before we close with prayer I, I want to keep in our minds that this idea that in the dispensation post 1844 that God's covenant keeping people have been re-established modern Israel have come back on the scene and that is an important concept to to grasp hold of in our understanding of what the 2520 is about and what God's purpose was for giving us that prophecy. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued mercy and tender goodness towards us. As we begin to put the pieces together, Lord, on the 2520, I pray that you would give us open hearts and minds to hear your voice speaking individually to us. For those brethren, Lord, who are being challenged by this material, I pray that you would give them open hearts and minds that they might see for themselves the truths that are contained in your word. Father, bless us, bless each of us, so that we might know what we should be doing, where we should be going, and how we should be behaving in the final days of earth's history. Father, bless our thoughts and guide us as in our next study we go into the book of Daniel to read further the truths there that Jesus Christ himself directed us to go to, that we might understand and receive a blessing. Grant unto us now all that you want to give to us, Lord, we pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.